Father, we are your children. We are in your house. We are glad to be in your house this morning, Lord. We come with hearts that are in different places. Lord, sometimes we have been disobedient to you and we seek your forgiveness, Lord, but your house is still open. Lord, sometimes we don't feel like coming, but we have come today and we have found, as always, Lord, your house is still open for us. Father, perhaps we are full of praise this morning. Perhaps our hearts are so close to you, Lord Jesus, this morning, but we're still so glad that your house was open, that it is always open, that we can come together. There is always room for us and always room for all who would come and seek your face, Lord. Help us to continue with you, to be comfortable in your house, to, to make ourselves at home, to learn, to live, to dwell in your house, Lord because you have told us it is always open. So help us to continue in that spirit as we spend our time together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. First of all, grab a seat. Be comfortable. This is, uh, this is different. Hey, uh, for one, I am very glad this was not last week when it was very cold that we were down here. Um, or the week before when it was very wet uh, that we were having to move down here. But, uh, so here we are. Um, I don't know if anyone else kind of felt it coming in. I know the, the media team did when they came downstairs. Uh, they were very excited about the backdrop that we have for our, for our service this morning. But we also, I don't know if you felt it too, just that we've been moved into a new place. Just a gentle reminder that God, he does new things, that it's not always as we expect that it's going to be. And that was for me a really nice reminder on this Sunday when we were looking at the idea of uh, worship uh, as part again of our intentional faith. We're going to go a bit, a bit shorter this morning um, because, yeah, we are, we're welcomed into a different place. Where worship, it's not always as we expect it's going to be. God isn't always as we're going to expect to find him. Um, when I was thinking a little bit about how do you describe, how do you describe worship in a way that's kind of succinct, kind of clear, kind of um, captures a lot. And for me, I ended up thinking it's one of these things that is almost easier to describe by the things that it's not. It's easier to realize when we are uh, maybe not worshiping or call out the things that we see that are not true worship. And it reminded me that in my marriage that sometimes I can be a little bit annoying. Um, I, I, can, I can sometimes not be uh, very helpful. For example, when Jacqueline asks, uh, what, do you, what do you want for dinner? And I'm like, I, I, don't, I don't mind, just, just whatever. Okay, so we'll have the same as we had last night. Ah, no, no, no thanks. I don't want that. Um, or what do you what do you want to watch on, on Netflix tonight? I, I, I don't mind. Okay, well, what's this new series? Ah, no, 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 I, I don't want to watch that. I, I say that I don't have an idea, that I don't have an opinion, but as soon as an option is presented to me, I'm like, oh, well, no, I know that I don't want that. And... For me, sometimes it's kind of like that way with worship, where we, um, you, you see the thing that it's not, you're like, it's not, it's not that. I can't fully describe it, but I know that sometimes it's not that. So let me pick out two things just quickly this morning to remind us, worship is not true when it gets these two key things uh, quite wrong. First of all, worship is to be given to God alone. I find this really interesting uh, quotation this week. The distinction that worship is to be given to God alone helps differentiate it from what we might feel for people. Gratitude, respect, love, perhaps even awe at their skill or accomplishment. Worship combines all of those things, but it extends beyond them also. If you're giving it to someone, to something that is not God, then it's both wrong and not worship. If we're worshipping 
um, as it says in, in, in Romans, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, worship the, and serve the, cre- the creature, the created things, rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Uh, growing up in a Presbyterian uh, tradition, we learned catechisms when I, was, when I was fairly young. And the first one, some of you may be familiar, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him. It is, it is who we are, who we are made to be. And so when we don't give God that position, we automatically put something else in that place of worship in our lives because that, that is our created nature, to be worshiping people. And so when we try to put things in the place of worship that aren't him, then we, yes, we're in a place of, of making an idol, but we're also not fulfilling who we are, who we were meant to be as God's created people, living to enjoy him and to glorify him. God is intentional. He was intentional when he made his very first uh, introduction in the commandments. Uh, We see, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And the first command and what? You shall have no other gods before me. For our worship to be right, to be true, to be pure, it is the worship of God alone. He was intentional in how he made us to be people who worship and to ensure that he put himself that he, he taught us to put him in that place of worship. We've been in this series of intentional faith and intentional faith, intentional worship flows from putting our Lord God first. It is our response to him, something he put out, who puts into us and then brings out. So a feeling as you come down the steps and you see the view, that that thing that grabs you, that way the music moves you, that uh, word in scripture or from a friend that takes you. We don't worship those things, but those things bring out the realization of the one who made us and our call to worship him. So we must be intentional about who we worship. And then the second thing we're calling out today is that we must be intentional about how we worship. Yeah, we get used to the patterns of things. We were, you know, even just pulling in the car park this morning. I'm used to parking close to the other end of the car park. And they're like, no, no, go down there. And I'm like, wait, 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 no, that's not what we do. We we go here. I just, we get just used to the patterns. This is the time I leave the house. This is when I arrive. This is where I go. This is possibly even where I sit, uh, the people that I speak to, how I go through. Uh, what we're used to experiencing through Sunday service and obviously beyond Sunday, how we, how we live out in the rest of our life as well. So we get used to the patterns of life, to the patterns of, um, of church, and we assume that we've got worship covered because we're, we're going through those motions, those, those, those patterns that we have made, that we have become so used to. Jesus calls out the Pharisees when they got used to a pattern, when they created a pattern of rules and laws and said, this is the way to be. This is the way to worship. If you get this right, then you're then you're you're playing the game right. Jesus says this people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. We might not teach different doctrines, but we might just teach a way of life. We might just teach a way of doing church, a way of coming and going and being and doing. Um, And we teach it as though that somehow that adds up to worship, to a full life in Christ. But maybe Jesus is saying to us sometimes also, you honor me with your lips. You honor me sometimes with the things that you're doing, but your heart is far from me. Jesus wasn't surprised by the legalism of the Pharisees when they put this obedience of man-made law above true worship. He quoted these words from Isaiah. This has been our pattern. This has been the pattern of man since the coming of sin. 
It's easy to put our outward expressions of, of life, of obedience, of worship above true worship, to take our hearts, let them be hardened and move them further from our Lord God. Has anyone ever, who, who drives, who drives, drives cars, drives longer distances for work, one or two? I don't know if anyone else um, has had an experience where you're driving, even driving through a town, you're driving a familiar route, and then after maybe a few hundred meters, you're like, oh, I don't quite remember how I got here. Like, I'm so used to the motion of driving. I'm so used to, I take this turn, I go this way, we stop, we, I watch out here, that's okay. And, and you move through it and you get to the other end and you, and you have a kind of, oh, wait, now I'm paying attention. But was I not paying attention? What, what did I not see? Um, we do the same things in conversation. You have a familiar friend who likes to return to a similar type of story um, to retell a situation and go over it and over it. And you're listening and you're agreeing and you're nodding and they ask you a question and you're like, ah, I, I, I don't think I was listening. <laughs> you have to fess up. It can be so easy to just get stuck, to go through the emotions and then wonder how you ended up where you are and wonder kind of where you go next because it's familiar. So we have to seek out that, that practice of worship, that practice of putting God first. Not that it's like pro-athleticism, but in some way there's some similarity. You know, someone who has played the game many, many times over knows how to, to play the game, but they also have to practice. They also have to pay attention. They also have to put something extra in for them to move forward. And so it is with us, a practice of putting God first or we can easily find ourselves in that position of the Pharisees. Obedient, about looking, about sounding like good people, but with hearts far from Jesus. So the big question, where is your heart this morning? And you will be familiar with the worship song, when the music fades, heart, heart of worship. Um, a sobering moment when I was looking this up this week, I learned that this song is now 20 years old. And I remember it was a new song. Um, so yeah, 20, 20 years, 20 years ago, but we're still singing. Um, it became something of a global Christian anthem, this song. It was written by Matt Redman um, and their church was doing well. Their, their church was full of people. They had their sounds down, their tech down, their lighting down, their, their, kind of, their whole uh, gig was all really squared and sorted out. And the pastor became concerned that people were coming and consuming in church, that the music sounded great, but where were the hearts of the people who were coming? And so the pastor unplugged the band. They moved out of their big room into the small room uh, next door. No instruments, no uh, audio equipment, no lights, no projectors, just people, their voices, their Bibles. And for it's kind of as long as it took. And Matt Redman describes it like this. The pastor of our church did a brave thing. We stopped using the PA and projectors, packed away our instruments for a while and gathered in an adjoining room with nothing but our voices and Bibles and of course our hearts. This led us into a whole new season. We stripped away anything associated with style, preference, performance, and there was a real sense of discovering the heart of worship again. And it's from there that Matt Redman wrote the song which one author says actually is certainly not one of the greatest songs of history, but it was a song for a moment. It was a song of confession, a song of commitment, and in some way a song of, of hope. I'm not about to unplug the band this morning or next week or any other week. Um, we have ESCOM to do that for us and an overworked generator that threatens to do it at any time. So we don't need, to, we're not there as a church, but as a church and as individuals, we, we do have to keep ourselves in check. The words of that song, when the music fades, all is stripped away. And I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth, that will bless your heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship 
and it's all about you, Jesus. To sing that it's all about you, Jesus, is to confess that actually I've made it about me, uh, about what I prefer, about what I like, or about something else that I put in your place. So, yeah, when we sing words of truth like we do in, uh, in worship when we're together, it's the decision to, to confess who we are, our need for Jesus. To say, I want you to have that place. And in the same way that we can keep ourselves in check and be intentional when we're together, we can do the same when we're outside and when we're, when we're going about. Worship that's all about Jesus calls us to more. To be more, to do more, to think more, to love more, to give more of ourselves, but ultimately to know him more. It calls us to know him more and to continue in worship of him. So worship can never stop with our singing or when we leave here on Sunday. I appeal to you from Romans. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. I started by saying it's hard to describe what worship is to give you a full picture, to plot its full extent. But we have a clear idea sometimes of what it isn't. It's not automatic. It's not if it's not God that we're worshipping. But a living sacrifice can't be measured. We're talking here about Jesus replacing the sacrifice. So this was your in the Old Testament. This was the sin that you have committed. So the appropriate sacrifice, the, the appropriate payment for that sin is, is this. There was a specific value um, and a specific atonement that could be made depending on what you had done. But this is a living sacrifice that we're called to give. Why? Because Jesus has fully paid the price of our sin. So there is nothing that we can do that takes us beyond what he has already given. I can't stand here and tell you to worship what worship is because there is no limit. We are to be living sacrifices. Every part of our life, every moment of our life. And so in doing so, we're also caught up today in a worship service that lasts forever in the kingdom of heaven. We have a, a foretaste of being part of his heavenly people. And another author put it like this. Christian worship is, among other things, the place where we catch a glimpse of the future reign from which and toward God calls us. A glimpse that both supports us in our pilgrimage and judges us in our attempts to be too settled. Worship should be uncomfortable to us. Uh, we get a fresh revelation that calls out who we are and who we need to be. Um, but also it's declaring that today we are his eternal people. Um, and there comes a day when we will worship him fully in spirit and in truth, without tiring, without uh, growing weak or weary, without worrying about ESCOM, without worrying about if we know the words, because we will be so full of the knowledge and love and experience of Jesus that we will not help to be his eternal worshipping people. And this, this life is a preview. And let's just keep in it. Let's keep experiencing it. Let's keep moving in it. Um, let's be intentional in our faith, intentional in our worship, because our God is intentional towards us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are your people who are called by your name. You seek that we would humble ourselves and pray, and we want to put ourselves in that humble position to know that you are the only one who is worthy of our praise, who is worthy of our worship, who is worthy of that part of our attention. It cannot be given to anyone else and nothing else can satisfy it. And so we, yeah, we seek to be your people. We seek to be your worshiping people. Yes, as we gather, yes, as we sing, but always as we go, as we live, as we are, help us to, to know you, to know you more that we might be called out to be more to do more, to seek you more and to worship you more. And we 
praise you that we can look forward to a day when we worship eternally in your very presence, God. Help us to yeah, enjoy this time, this preview of heaven, and to dwell fully with you. In Jesus' name, amen. May we all rise.